our second lecture on protein carbohydrate interactions we will be looking at the specifics of these types of interactions in a bit more detail there here we'll be looking at families of proteoglycans the types of protein interactions with the specific carbohydrate recognition domains and what the biological significance of these glycoproteins are methods for analysis and what we mean by advanced glycation end products in a tetrahydride tetrasaccharide linker that we have for the proteoglycans we will see what amino acid residues are involved in this specific recognition if we look at what proteoglycans are there are around 40 types of proteoglycans which are able to be produced by mammalian cells now of these we see there is here there is a code protein that has a c terminus and an n terminus what happens here is, is we have a tetrasaccharide linker that is blue that is connected with the chondritin for sulfate we looked at this specific type of interaction or the specific type type of linkers that are available where we have the core protein and we remember that it was linked to the serine amino acid residue now at the reducing end of the linker here xylose for example in this particular case is joined to the oh of the serine amino acid side chain by its aromatic carbon and this tetrasaccharide linker then connects the protein with this specific chondroitin sulfate there are two major families of membrane heparin sulfate proteoglycans these are the syndicans this is a single transmembrane domain when we looked at the membrane proteins we found that there were base on carbohydrate linkers to these proteins that were available for several biological activities including cell cell addition trans signal transduction and so on and so forth so to understand how these are linked together is important in looking at their domains their specific types of interactions and how they may be linked to other proteins this specific type the syndicant is a single transmembrane domain and it has an extracellular domain that carries 3 to 5 chains of a heparin sulfate in some cases this may be also chondroitin sulfate glycans on the other hand they are attached to the membrane by a lipid anchor so a derivative of the lipid phosphatidyl inositol so what we have here is the linkages here of the carbohydrates to the protein can be involved by a lipid anchor or could have a specific domain that would link these to the proteins now what can happen is both of these can actually be shared to the extracellular space available there are specific domains that are called highly sulfated domains so if we look at a pictorial representation of our membrane our lipid bilayer membrane and try to identify and look at the different connectivities that link these carbohydrate units to our proteins of interest so if this is a rough a cartoon representation of the protein chain we have the amino and the carboxy terminals and to this we have attached say heparin sulfate or chondroitin sulfate on the outside so this then would be recognized by other proteins or by other activities in the cell other moieties in the cell that would link these with them for the specific functionalities that would be required in this case we have a glyco anchor here the gpi anchor and here we have a globular domain that has so this is the linker and this is our domain which has as we can see disulfide linkage a regular protein domain so the core protein that is present here is then linked to the sites now for there are sometimes specific cleavage sites that shed these glycoproteins to the extracellular space this is an example of syndican and this is an example of a glycan now in the membrane therefore we have the syndicans that are held by hydrophobic interactions 
because they were in the lipid membrane bilayer that we saw. So we know that the lipid membrane bilayer and the protein was a single transmembrane protein. So the hydrophobic interactions are important here, where we would have a sequence of non-polar amino acid residues and plasma membrane lipids. And what happens is they can be released by a single proteolytic cut near the membrane surface, as we saw in the previous slide. Glycans, on the other hand, are held by a covalently attached membrane lipid, that is the GPI anchor, and they can be detached where the bond between the lipid portion of the GPI anchor, that is the phosphodetyl inositol, and the oligosaccharide linked to the protein is cleaved by an enzyme called phospholipase. So this is where the specific glycoprotein can be released due to a prote proteolytic cut that is enzyme driven. So this proteoglycan shedding is involved in cell cell recognition and adhesion and is highly regulated and activated in also the proliferation and differentiation of cells. So a protease in this extracellular matrix is a cuts close to the membrane surface and it releases these ectodomains of the specific proteoglycans. The proteoglycan shedding, for example, has this phospholipase, the enzyme that breaks the connection to the membrane, membrane lipid to release the glycans. We can also have chemical release of the high glycans, where in this case what happens, there is hydrogenolysis, where an anhydrous hydrazine is used to cleave the complete glycan from the peptide backbone. So we understand that this necessary is, this is necessary for the proteoglycan shedding for specific activities related to the cell. Now what happens is, because these mechanisms that result in proteoglycan shedding, they are a very uh, common way where a cell can change its surface features quickly. So understanding that when we have the cell membrane, the cell membrane where, we, where the integral cell membranes, if we are looking at that, have these carbohydrate connectivities or the, the carbohydrate connections to them and they are cleaved off, this adopts of the membrane surface will adapt to a different type of surface feature. So this may be involved in surface surface recognition for cell cell addition and other activities as well. The glycoproteins in general, therefore, will have our specific glycosaminoglycan chains. They bind to a variety of extracellular ligands and they can modulate the ligand interaction with specific receptors on the cell surface, which are important for the functionalities that they are involved in. So if this is our overall protein chain that is either embedded or on the surface of our membrane of the cell, then we can have a variety of linkages of these different types of carbohydrates that can then be used for different properties. For example, if we look at a conformational activation, a conformational activation where we have heparin sulfate, we have then the antithrombin. So there is a protein antithrombin on the on binding a specific pentasaccharide NS domain results in the interaction with the blood clotting factor. Now this blood clotting factor prevents the blood clotting. So what happens in this case is because of the binding to the surface, so this AT bind then if it binds to the surface, it changes its surface functionality, changes the characteristics of its surface because it has now bound this pentasaccharide to it. And this then will, because of this feet structural feature now, this factor 10A, which is a blood clotting factor, can then be attached to the antithrombin. So this means that there are enhanced protein-protein interactions possible because of these carbohydrate variations. So if we look at a specific site here where we have the modified antithrombin, then we have the thrombin come into the picture. Then if this binds, then the binding of the antithrombin and the thrombin 
will occur to in two adjacent domains and this brings the two proteins in close proximity proximity this results in the interaction which inhibits blood clotting so the, this is the way the specific um, terminology or the specific workings of the cell due to the protein protein interactions based on carbohydrate binding we have the co-receptor for extracellular ligands as well. Here, the NS domains interact with both the fibroblast growth factor and its receptor. And what happens in this case, it brings the oligomeric complex close together and increases the effectiveness even at low concentrations of the growth factor. So if we have our lipid membrane, we can see that the important aspects here are the specific proteins that are bound to the lipids where we have most of the carbohydrates bound. So we have our core protein that tra traverses the membrane and we have specific receptor proteins in the membrane. So this is an FGF receptor dimer that is a fibroblast growth factor dimer and a specific domain that then allows the binding of the FGF ligand, which is useful for its specific activity. This means that the cell surface localization and concentration is important. And the interesting aspect is the high density of the negative charges in the heparin sulfate that can attract the positively charged lipoprotein lipase molecules and hold them in place non-covalently by electrostatic and sequence-specific interactions. So we have a complementarity in the chemical moieties here where there is a possibility of specific non-covalent interactions. So we have our protein embedded here, specific domains from the core protein that would be able to have the lipoprotein lipase attached to it and as a result of which we would have the cleavage or we would have a specific activity associated with the lipoprotein and the advantage of having the complementarity in charges allows this connection to take place. In terms of glycoproteins, these carbohydrate protein conjugates, the glycans are smaller branched and they're more structurally diverse than the other types of larger molecules that we saw like the glycosamine glycans or the proteoglycans the, of the proteoglycans. So these glycoproteins are relatively smaller in size and the carbohydrate in this case is attached to its anomeric carbon through a glycosidic link. This is either to the OH of a serine or a threonine residue which we also saw previously and in the previous lecture as well or through an N-glycoside link to the amide nitrogen of an asparagine residue. So these residues are important in the connectivity of the protein with the specific sugar moieties. In the oligosaccharide linkages in gly glycoproteins, we have O-linked type where here again we have the serine residue that is linked to a sugar and we have either the N-linked type where we would have the asparaginic. So here is our N-link type and here is our O-link type depending upon the specific linkages with the specific types of ligands based on the amino acid residues in this case serine and asparagine. So when we look at this, if we have look at specific examples, so we have this is the way they would be connected in their oligosaccharide linkages in the glycoproteins. So when we look at these specific types of linkages and we realize their importance, about half of all proteins of mammals are actually glycosidated. And many of the proteins secreted by the eukaryote are glycoproteins and including most of the proteins in the blood. For example, immunoglobulins, there are several hormones such as the follicle stimulating hormone, the luteinizing hormone, the thyroid stimulating hormone and some proteins that are secreted by the pancreas. All of these are glycoproteins. Many of them have 
their functionalities based on the carbohydrate that is linked to the protein. We now look into the biological advantages of adding oligosaccharides to proteins. The addition of these hydrophilic clusters of carbohydrates can often change the polarity and the solubility of the proteins with which they are conjugated. As a result, the oligosaccharide chains can be attached to newly synthesized proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum and expanded in the Golgi complex. They can also act in protein quality control by targeting misfolded proteins for degradation. So the other ways in which they could be advantageous is because if there were many negatively charged oligosaccharide chains that occupy, say, a single region of the protein, then the charge repulsion could result in structural variation or conformational changes in a way that would result in an extended rod-like structure that may be important to the protein's functionalities. The advantage of the negative and the steric oligosaccharide chains also sometimes give protection to some proteins from being attacked by proteolytic enzymes. So, there are also many different genetic disorders of glycosylation that, that are present in humans that actually cause defects in physical or mental development. So we understand the importance of having these or the advantage also of having the oligosaccharide chains attached to our proteins. The proteins that bind carbohydrates is something that we saw in the previous lecture when we looked at lectins. This lectin is a protein can, that can bind to our carbohydrate, but in most of these cases, like we looked at in our discussions on membrane proteins, we find that the carbohydrates are linked directly to the protein molecules. However, these lectins can look at specific soluble carbohydrates and they can bind to the soluble carbohydrates individually or bind to a carbohydrate moiety that is part of a glycoprotein. So we could have a conjugation in a manner that is commonly seen on membrane proteins. This is involved as we would be expecting as cell adhesion in glycoprotein synthesis to regulate blood protein levels and also the binding of soluble extracellular and intracellular, intracellular glycoprotein. The three different type of lectins that we looked at in the previous lecture were the C type lectins. These lectin, so each of these lectins have a carbohydrate recognition domain. So the lectin domains in this case play a role in cell-cell adhesion, immune response to pathogens, as well as apoptosis. The I-type lectins play an important role in the development and the maintenance of the nervous system. And the P-type lectins are involved in the generation of lysosomes in the cells of higher eukaryotes. The lectins have very high binding affinities for specific sugars, as would be expected. And for example, plant lectins also have affinities for specific glycoproteins. And in the process, they play a very significant role in nitrogen fixation. This is an example of a crystal structure of a plant lectin in its ligand bound form. So the importance of lectin in their affinity for specific sugars involves an understanding of their specific functionalities. Other types of proteins that are also known as lectins, we have the selectin that we will just look at in a bit detail. So we have the cadherin, selectins, and integrins. All of these are well-known cell adhesion molecules as adhesion receptors. The integrins are the proteins that attach the cell cytoskeleton to the extracellular matrix mechanically, and then they sense whether the adhesion has actually occurred through biochemical manner. The cadherins, on the other hand, mediate the addition between cells. What selectins do are, th there are different types of selectins based on where they attach to. So this is also a family of cell addition molecules that 
are plasma membrane lectins. So they share similar properties with the C-type lectins as we can see because they are involved in cell-cell adhesion. So they mediate cell-cell recognition and adhesion in several ways in a variety of cellular processes. There is the E-selectin, that is the endothelial cell selectin. Then there is the leukocyte cell selectin, that is the L-selectin. And the P-selectin, a platelet-like selectin. So this is a structure of the P-selectin molecule. And we can see the bound portion of the carbohydrate here. So if we look at these cell surface lectins, their importance lie in the addition of the molecules. So, for example, cell surface lectins can mediate the addition of white blood cells to endothelial cells and plates, platelets under flow conditions. For example, we can have the movement of immune cells, the leukocytes, through the capillary wall from blood to tissues at the sites of infection or inflammation. And these lectins are involved in the cell addition properties or the cell addition functionalities that are required for this process to occur. The selectins are a single chain transmembrane glycoproteins. We had discussed transmembrane glycoproteins in our membrane proteins lecture. What they have is they have an extracellular domain that binds to the carbohydrate moiety, a transmembrane domain, and an intracellular domain that binds to the cytoskeleton. So this is the basic structure of a lectin. And in the variety of lectins that we saw, the E, the L, and the P, what they do is they have a variation in their units for this. So we have the L-selectin, the P-selectin, and the L-selectin. So the E, L, P-selectin, each of these have a variation, and it could be three, five, seven, nine units, depending upon their specific function. The residues of, for example, the protectivity that we see, the protection that we see, are residues of a silic acid that are situated at the ends of oligosaccharide chains of many plasma glycoproteins. Now, what these do is these protect these proteins from uptake and degradation in the liver. For example, this is like a protective cap where for example, if we look at celluloplasmin, this is a glycoprotein that is produced in the liver. Now, the receptor celluloplasmin interaction can trigger endocytosis and could result in the destruction of celluloplasmin. However, what happens, the residues of sialic acid can protect these proteins from uptake and degradation in the liver. So, we looked at these different types of oligosaccharides that can be attached to the proteins and also a methodology of lectins that bind to the carbohydrates themselves, not going into the basic mechanism of action, but an understanding that the role of these proteins in cell-cell adhesion and other properties associated with the cells and with biochemical processes. But we would also need to know how we can detect protein-carbohydrate interactions. And in this case, the glycomics is the systematic characterization of all of the carbohydrate components of a given cell or tissue, including that those that are active, attached to proteins and to lipids. So what happens if we do a test for glycoproteins, it can determine whether the proteins are glycosylated and where in the amino acid sequence the oligosaccharide is attached. And it offers into normal patterns of glycosylation and they can be altered in the case of disease. So if we look at the methods of carbohydrate analysis, the structures of oligosaccharides and polysaccharides are usually determined by a combination of methods. There is a specific enzymatic hydrolysis to determine the stereochemistry of the glycosidic bond. There is mass spectroscopy and high-resolution NMR that could be used, mass spectrometry and high-resolution NMR that can be used for small samples of carbohydrates. In addition, there can be microarrays of pure oligosaccharides that are useful to determine specificity and binding affinity. 
For example, if we look at an example of a microarray, so to identify proteins with specific affinity for a particular oligosaccharide, we can use an oligosaccharide microarray. This is a microarray plate, a cartoon representation of microarray plate, and we have the attachment of the specific oligosaccharide on the attached to this microarray plate. This is then flushed with protein, and a specific protein may bind to one of the oligosaccharides that are attached to the microarray. The rest is then, so we have the probe with the fluorescently labeled glycan binding protein. Then we rinse and clean. Those that have a, a binding protein attached to the oligosaccharide would remain and they can be detected. So there will be binding occur and they can determine the specificity and binding of the carbohydrates because we see all these different moieties that did not have a specific attachment site for the protein under uh, determination. Another very important method is glycated hemoglobin detection, which is a form of hemoglobin that is chemically linked to a sugar. In this case, we have the hemoglobin plus the glucose that forms what is called a shift base. And this shift base can form what is called, we will not go into the details, but an amatory product that can be detected by a specific chemical method. This is called HB, the hemoglobin, and once it is attached, it is HbA1ac. This is a typical test method to determine the amount of sugar connected. So, glycated hemoglobin, commonly known as HbA1ac, is a form of hemoglobin that is used to measure average plasma glucose concentration over prolonged periods and is a commonly used pathological test. It is a non-enzymatic glycation pathway caused by the interaction of glucose with hemoglobin and it, HbA1ac is a measure of a specific component and this is a test for monitoring the sugar control specifically in individuals with diabetes. In the hemoglobin glycation reaction, there are the production of advanced glycation end products so we looked at the formation of the shift base. This is followed by a series of rearrangements, oxidations and dehydrations, a lot of pro chemical processes, biochemical processes involved, and it produces a mixture of what are called these advanced glycation end products or AGEs that can be monitored to check the extent of the glycation reaction on hemoglobin. So. These products can leave the erythrocyte and form covalent crosslinks between proteins. And what they will do in that case, they would interfere with normal protein function. So in people with diabetes, there is the accumulation of the high concentrations of AGEs, the advanced glycation end products, by crosslinking critical proteins that can cause damage to the kidneys, the retina, and also the cardio vascular system. You will hear, you can probably heard about diabetic retinopathy, which is where the retina is involved. So what we have looked at in these two lectures of proteins and carbohydrate interactions is we have looked at the family of proteoglycans, the types of protein interactions with domains, which amino acids are specifically involved in the interaction with the carbohydrates, the biological significance of the glycoproteins and methods for carbohydrate analysis and an example of how we have the lectins that are the specific proteins that bind carbohydrates or carbo glycoproteins where they have already been bound to a sugar. And we looked at advanced glycation end products in a manner to check for diabetic patients in the case where the glucose levels are high. These are the references. Thank you.